Okay, very good morning to everybody as we start today's webinar. Um, as always, just do me a quick favor. Just let me know if you guys can see my screen as well as hear my voice. Um, doing a quick audio and visual check, and then we can get going with today's um, webinar. Okay, there's a little bit of an echo here somewhere in the background. Let me just quickly try and solve that. Okay, that seems that seems okay. Okay, great stuff. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Uh, thanks, Shauna, Stuart, Dominic, uh, Ravinda, uh, Rolando, Asanka, Mahesh, Yanku, Shane, Paul, Kumzele. Great stuff to have you guys in the room. Um, Thank you for joining us today. In today's session, I believe we also have a few members of the um, bigger community um, joining us as well. Uh, I'm not sure from which end they are joining, whether that is going to be from Facebook or whether it's going to be from YouTube, but I know that a few guys will also be joining us. So very welcome to everybody uh, in the greater channel that's also going to be joining us for this live session today. So jumping right into today's session um, looking firstly at the overall risk zone, um, as always. So let's just quickly take a recap of what happened yesterday. Now, yesterday, so to speak, was the first actual trading uh, day of the week. Obviously, on Monday, we had a US as well as UK bank holiday. So not a lot of um, volume or liquidity in the market. Yesterday saw a very, very big move across risk assets, very positive risk zone across the board, um, mainly due to the market's and continuously looking through some of the more um, negative aspects um, or negative catalysts in the markets like the US China trade uh, tensions and choosing to focus rather on the developments that we had with the uh, latest vaccines, uh, the drug developments, as well as more and more economies starting to open up, starting to ease down with their lockdown restrictions. And that has seen obviously um, lots, of, um, lots of upside across the board in yesterday's session. Now, what happened at the end of yesterday's session is we did have a couple of announcements coming out from, uh, from the U.S. side. Now, just to quickly recap, um, we had the U.S. saying that they are considering sanctions on Chinese officials and firms, obviously due to the Hong Kong legislation. And we also had U.S. President Trump coming out saying that we will hear about possible U.S. sanctions or, or U.S. actions on China by the end of this week. Now, something that we did highlight um, in our top trading opportunities report for this week is a very important point that we just quickly need to uh, take a few seconds on uh, just to explain this to everybody. What we said was currently we've had lots and lots of threats um, coming out from, uh, from the US as well as um, the Chinese side, but what we haven't really seen is any action. So we haven't really seen the US take actual action or actual retaliation against um, China, whether that is in the form of uh, the sanctions, whether that is in the form of taking away Hong Kong's privileges. Um, there's many things that they threatened to do, but they haven't actually done anything yet. So it's been lots of to and fro in terms of rhetoric, but until they actually do something, uh, we're not really seeing, um, we, we're basically expecting the market to fade. Any of the, of the more negative comments coming out from the US and China, and basically only reacting strongly when we get actual action from the two sides. And that is exactly what we saw yesterday as well. We saw downside in equities across the board, especially US equities um, on the back of the news um, about the possible sanctions. And then, of course, in today's session, we've just seen risk assets largely fade that move at the start of the uh, asia Pac session as well as the start of the European trading session. Now, of course... We did start out with a more mixed risk tone, to be honest. Equities was up across the board. We, did, we didn't really see the same type of movements across other asset classes. Bond yields uh, were trading more mixed. Commodities were trading more mixed as well as currencies. But of course, we did have some recent news coming out in today's session, um, specifically with regards to the EU's um, recovery fund proposal. Now, um, risk tones has seen a sharp U-turn on the back of that. We have seen equity markets move up across the board. Uh, we will discuss exactly what is uh, the actual news that came out, but we saw movements across the board to the upside in equities. Uh, also very interesting to see that the Eurostoxx 50 has now joined the party of most of the global indexes, also breaking out of that most recent range price action that we've seen, currently trading uh, very close to that 3040 resistance area, which is a key level for the Eurostox 50 in today's session on the back of that news. Now, the news that we're talking about is, of course, the proposal 
from the EU Commission. Now, for those of you that's not aware what is happening today, um, in the terminal, of course, and in our videos for today, we highlighted the fact that today is the discussion um, of the EU Recovery Fund, where the European Commission basically needs to uh, table the recent uh, Franco-German recovery, uh, recovery Fund proposal, but also obviously add in some of their own um, proposals to try and um, get some form of agreement between the 27 member states. Now, what happened earlier in today's session is we had an announcement, a very important one, saying that the EU Commission is reportedly um, looking for a 750 billion uh, recovery fund. Now, that is uh, much larger than the prior one. What the Franco-German proposal offered was a 500 billion proposal in grants, which is basically the first part. Um, but then they've also added in 250 billion worth in loans. Now, the reason why they added loans um, was obviously due to the pushback that we had over the weekend from the more frugal states. Uh, they called the frugal four, which is basically Austria, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, and Sweden. And what they said is that, listen, guys, this 500 billion uh, is a little bit too much. Um, the, the size was, was one of the, the issues that they had. And also, apart from that, they didn't want to offer that 500 billion in the form of um, of grants like the uh, Franco German proposal, they wanted to offer it in the form of loans rather. So there was a lot of speculation about how the European Commission will um, will basically propose it, whether they will take that 500 billion and split it up, uh, making a percentage of it, you know, uh, yeah, putting it out to loans and a, another percentage putting it out in grants. And what they've basically come out and done is saying that, okay, they're going to take the German Franco proposal. They're going to um, have it still as 500 billion in grants, but they now added 250 uh, billion on top of that in loans. Now, the 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 initial reaction was, of course, majorly positive. We've seen the euro break out of that 110 or break above that very important 110 as a psychological level to the upside. This has been very important resistance for the pair um, over the last couple of weeks. Lots of, um, lots of times we tested that area, we've seen rejection in the pair. So we have now broken above that. Um, we've also, as we said, seen a risk on tone develop on the back of that news. Now, the thing about the thing about the proposal right now that we just need to keep in mind is that the market is obviously getting ahead of themselves in the hopes that the uh, European uh, Commission will be able to to get that bigger stimulus plan uh, across the table. But we still need a unanimous agreement from all 27 member states. And the fact that the frugal four was already opposed to the size of the 500 billion uh, makes the 750 billion a slightly higher hurdle to be able to jump over for all 27 member states to agree on. So that's the first cautious point that we just need to consider. Secondly, as we said, we need unanimity across the 27 member states. So if any of them don't agree to it, um, the proposal can't go ahead. It can't get approved. So there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of room for messy price action today. There's a lot of room for disappointment. The market is obviously priced in um, a 750 um, a potential approval. That is why we've seen that massive move to the upside. Let's just quickly compare the high to the low. Now, basically, we've got a 100 pip movement in the euro US dollar. So the market's already hopeful for that 1750. So if we get a rejection of the deal, um, that's obviously going to see a very quick reversal of that move to the downside. Now, if we do get an agreement on the deal, there's a couple of nuances that we just need to keep in mind. So the first one is that let's say we do get an agreement across the table, but we get a reduction in the size. So we have the proposal currently sitting at 500 billion in grants and 250 million in loans. Um, we might end up at 500 billion, the original plan being split up between grants and loans. Now, even though that will be a positive, we might see another knee-jerk reaction to the upside. It'll be less now than the markets are currently expecting, which is 270, uh, 700, sorry, uh, 750 um, billion. So always keep in mind what the markets are expecting and what the markets are pricing in. That's very, very important for uh, evaluating the type of reaction that we might get from these type of events. So if we do get that approval, but it's a lesser amount, we might see a knee-jerk reaction, but we might see a pullback. We might see the markets reject from that because it's now a lesser amount than the 750. Also keep in mind that the loan to grant ratio will be very important to keep in mind, especially um, as it re uh, relates back to debt risks. So the reason why we saw uh, lots of upside in something like the BTB boon spread 
um, a while back is because of the debt, uh, the debt risk. So the rising, rising debt risk um, for uh, countries like Italy, like Spain, is a real concern for the Eurozone. There's been a lot of speculation that we might be facing a new potential debt crisis like we had back in two, uh, 2012. Now, obviously, with the proposal, um, that will alleviate some of the stress on the debt markets for something like Italy, for something like pain, uh, like Spain. Um, but the one thing that will cause a lot of pain right now is if the ratio between grants and loans um, is more loans versus grants. And the problem with that for countries like Italy and like Spain, of course, is that that will basically just add to their debt. So it doesn't really, it takes the, the short term stress of liquidity um, away, but it also adds that um, debt risk back into the picture. So if we see a very lopsided ratio in terms of loans to grants, that can also be a potential uh, factor to consider, even if a approval is reached. And then number three, another nuance is the actual time frame or the availability of these funds. So let's say we do get an agreement today. There's been speculation that the funds might only be available from the first quarter of 2021. Now, for most Italian companies and Spanish companies, that's going to be too late. So this will obviously change. A, it'll solve the liquidity problem, but it is not going to be quick enough. Or it might not be quick enough to solve the solvency problem, which is another big concern that the market is facing right now. So there's, there's a couple of things we just need to keep in mind. Obviously, as we said, the market has jumped on the positive news. And rightly so, it is a big move in the right direction for the European Commission. Um, but for me personally, uh, I'm taking this with a very, very big pinch of salt right now. There's still a lot that can, uh, that can go wrong. Of course, the biggest reaction to the upside for today for the euro, also for risk assets, is if the uh, frugal four actually um, completely comes out and we have a unanimous confirmation and agreement on that new proposal. So that'll be a bigger, a bigger stimulus package. Uh, the... Um, uh, uh, more debt-stricken countries will get what they want. The frugal ones will get that they want. So everybody can be happy if they just accept this. We can see some upside. Can be happy days for a couple of sessions for uh, European equities as well as the euro. Um, but it is just something we need to keep in mind is that that is, in my opinion, that it's a, it's a stretch getting this thing across the board, especially in that current proposal form. But if we do get it, obviously we're going to see lots of upside. And even if we do get it, but we see a couple of changes and um, like we said, those nuances, we just need to keep that in mind. Now, we had a very interesting question coming over the Q&A uh, just before we started the webinar, which is why, why we're continuously looking at something like the BTB Bund spread. What is it? So the BTB is basically Italian bonds and the Bund is obviously German bonds uh, or bonds. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the Italian yield versus the German yield. So this is basically the bond spread. Um, it is called the BTB Bund spread. So it's the 10-year bond spread between Italy and Germany. And this is a really good gauge of overall risk premium measurement across the Eurozone. So whenever we see the spread rise to the upside, that is a very bad thing that normally um, results in a downside pressure on the Euro because it means that the markets are basically not interested in Italian uh, bonds. So remember when um, th there's two, there's two uh, um, times when your bond yields will rise. So your bond, your bond yields will always rise when your, um, when your bond price falls. And there's two scenarios where your bond price can fall. It can either fall um, because people don't want it, so it needs to offer a lower price for people to be interested, or of course it can fall if there is interest rate expectations. So um, what's happening with the Italian bond yields right now is that people don't really want to buy them uh, because of the default risk. And whenever you see that uh, the bond price rise, you see the, the uh, sorry, the bond price fall, you see the bond yield rise. And whenever you have that big rise in, in the bond spread between Italian and German bonds, that's normally a good sign of a risk premium building up. So. The fact that we've seen downside um, in that is obviously a positive for the euro. That's why we've seen upside in the euro. Um, and that is the reason why we're looking at this particularly is it's, it's a very important input for the overall risk, uh, a measurement of risk for the eurozone, um, a, a very good um, gauge of eurozone risk, if you will, to always uh, just have a quick look at. So that is why we're looking at this. So again, keep in mind that the markets are now already pricing in that 750 billion. So if there is agreement, but it comes in lower, um, or the grant to loan ratio is skewed, or the time frame. Those are all considerations we just need to keep in mind um, for the for the rest of the session in order to trade um, the euro as well as the overall risk sentiment. Then other things we also need to watch out is yesterday we had an interesting day in terms of the pound. 
lots of upside in the pound across the board. Obviously, not only uh, due to the uh, to the dollar weakness, but we had some positive developments with regards to Brexit. Now, currently, in terms of the more medium term outlook, and now shifting to a more shorter term uh, concern as well, is the lack of progress that we've made with Brexit recently. So, looking at the um, the stance where things were, just last week we had literally no progress made. We have the risk of PM Johnson actually walking away from discussions totally. He did warn that that is something that he will do in June, which is basically next week if there's no uh, progress made in the discussions. And what happened yesterday is the EU came out and basically softened their um, red line or hard line uh, with regards to fisheries. And that was seen as a positive. That's why we saw upside across the board in, uh, in the pound. Now, what we're looking for in the short term for the pound now um, obviously, we have some negative inputs right now in terms of the furlough scheme as well. Um, but in the broader, uh, bigger picture, something like Brexit developments will basically dwarf any uh, concerns the market currently has about the furlough scheme. So just keep that in mind. Now, what we're looking for today is um, possible further Brexit developments from the EU side. Um, and of course, the UK coming out and now responding to what the EU said. If we see a further um, positive, um, positive comments coming out from the UK side as well, um, that can obviously see some upside uh, being built into and priced into for the pound for Brexit. So definitely a development we're watching in today's session as well. And then, of course, what we're also watching is the ongoing, as we said, US and China um, relations. Right now, um, if we do see actual retaliation in the form of companies being um, sanctioned, entities being sanctioned, any type of actual retaliation should see a more meaningful move um, to the downside and risk assets. Until we get an actual retaliation, of course, we're not really expecting any um, follow through in movements. We are expecting the markets to, um, to likely fade those type of comments um, if it isn't backed up with actual action. So also something just to keep in mind, if we do see President Trump or the US administration or even China coming out later and again, spewing some negative rhetoric, it's not gonna be expected to really move the market until it is actually followed through with some action as well. And then, of course, also watching out for further drug developments. There's lots and lots of um, uh, development going on right now in terms of vaccines. Uh, I read an article over the weekend in Bloomberg. I think there's something like um, 12 or 15 um, vaccines that's currently being developed across the globe. There's something like also 10 or 15 antivirals being developed um, some other uh, uh, treatments also. So a, a big range of companies are currently uh, in that race to try and find a solution. So a couple of things that we just need to keep in mind. Obviously, we saw that big move to the upside last week when we had the Moderna news. Now, it came out not being too flattering after all, um, but that is something that we can expect going forward. As these companies start to progress with these developments, we should get these type of announcements more and more and more across the board. But just like anything else, the market will eventually get used to those type of things. So we should see lesser of, an, uh, of a reaction as we, uh, the more and more we get those type of, uh, of comments coming through. So for today's session, just to sum up what we're looking for in terms of economic data, a very, very light session, um, nothing really major that we need to watch out for. Uh, but we do need to watch out for further developments with regards to the um, the recovery fund. Of course, watching out for any Brexit developments and then watching out for any US-China developments. Now, in today's session, with the markets moving up in terms of risk flows, there is obviously the opportunity to look for some um, to look for some uh, risk sensitive or high beta currencies versus the safe havens to the upside. But again. I would be a little bit cautious in trading um, on that positive side right now, even trading the euro to the upside right now, just because there is a lot that can go wrong right now. Obviously, if you're a more aggressive trader, you can look for some short-term opportunities to the upside in the euro in the run-up to the event or in the run-up to the discussions with the eurozone, um, as we, we should see some further support until we get some more, um, uh, more information. But for now, for me personally, I'm just staying on the little bit more cautious side with this. I'm not seeing any any major opportunities right now until we get some, um, some actual agreement and some actual um, uh, information from what the member states say about that proposal. So that is, um, I think, everything from my side. Um, let me just quickly go through this list and see if there's anything else that I wanted to go through with you guys. Um, No, I think that is that is everything. So now is a perfect spot for you guys to just ask any questions that you have. Uh, do me a favor, just pop all the questions that you have, guys, into the Q&A box. 
it just makes it easier for me to keep track of everything. Um, and uh, for those watching from Facebook or either YouTube, um, you're also welcome to pop in a couple of questions. Of course, I'm going to go through and answer all of our Forex or subscriber questions first. Um, and if we have some time afterwards, we'll make sure to, um, to squeeze in a couple of questions from there as well. So let's just quickly go through the first one here from Shane. Um, Shane is asking, when we hear a central bank is buying coupons, et cetera, is that positive for that currency? So the, the thing to keep in mind for any type of short-term uh, open market operations, um, Shane, is that the, the market will already be pricing in um, asset purchases way before things happen, whether it's um, short-term uh, operations. Many times in the terminal, you'll find information on uh, the, the latest buying from the Fed or the latest buying from the ECB in terms of asset purchases. Now, these things from a day-to-day -day basis don't really move the market that much. It's because they've already been priced in. So when we see the biggest reaction from something like actual asset purchases is when um, the market catches the first whiff that it might happen. So the expectations of Kiwi happening will already see a move to the upside. A very, very good example of this um, was when we had the news coming out from the Fed on the 23rd of March, where they said that they will be um, buying corporate bonds as well as certain ETFs uh, as part of the asset purchase program. And on the back of that expectation, uh, we actually saw a big rally in some of the corporate bond um, uh, corporate bond ETFs to the upside like LQD and HYG. We saw lots of upside to the um, moves to the upside as the market's already pricing in that QE um, or that asset purchases for those type of bonds. And when the actual purchases started, uh, we didn't really see any meaningful reaction um, in those assets. So um, think of those things as, as just part of the normal day-to-day -day operations. They're not going to be something that's going to move the market in the very short term. Uh, the, the things that will really move the market in terms of those actual buying uh, is when the market catches the first whiff of what's going to happen, uh, or the, you know, the central bank comes out and saying that okay, you know, we've uh, they have an unlimited QE program. They're going to scale that back to a set amount, or um, they're going to increase corporate bond purchases to an X amount. Uh, those type of announcements, those are the real things, the real money makers, and um, that we can trade. But as the, as as it as it goes through the, the daily operations, not really a um, lot of movements uh, expected from those type of moves. Um, Nick uh, is asking, uh, I'm, I'm well, thank you, um, Nick. Can you get the B2B spread in Icon? Um, Nick, I'm pretty sure you can. I know there's a feature. Um, there's a feature that I used to use. Let me, let me just quickly see if I can find it for you. Um, they actually have a yield, um, a, a yield section where you can go to where you can actually um, uh, we, we can actually compare um, the spreads. Let me just see if I can find something like that for us. Um, sorry, guys. Let me just um, just see what this thing is called. Um, so. Okay, I think this is the one. I think this is the one. Let me just quickly pop that up. So uh, you see this one is called uh, interest rate spread chart. And what you can do with this one is you can basically go and select, let's say the, uh, let's take Italy, for example. And let's take the 10 year. Uh, we might need to flip this one around, but let's go to, um, let's go to Germany and take the 10 year. There we go. So it's exactly the same chart. So I'm not sure what it's called. Just try and type in uh, in your search bar, just try and type in interest rate spread chart um, and it should give you something like this. And um, there's also related code. Um, but if you can't find it, just let me know in one of the Q and A's. Um, and I can just quickly do a video for us on, on how to find it. I can't remember what you type in exactly, but I think it's, if you just type in interest rate spread chart, you should get it. Um, and then you can basically just type in the exact one that you, that you want to be looking at. So it is possible, um, but not, not hundred percent sure how we get to that one. For me, it's just easier to do it on, on trading view. 
Um, but of course, if you, if you don't have TradingView, then um, you can definitely do it on, on, uh, on Zenith. Okay, quick question here from Muhammad. Um, uh, you are unable to get into trades, uh, even the trade ideas. Um, you're a day trader and a bit unclear of how to get into a trade in time uh, on a break, on a retracement, because most of the time uh, retracement pullback doesn't happen uh, just like yesterday um, trade ideas. So, um, Muhammad, let's just quickly look at a few of the examples from yesterday. Um, there was actually quite a few examples that you could have traded from. Um, yesterday, we had the break. Um, was it on the euro? I think we had an example on the euro. We had an example on the pound yen. Um, yeah, there we go. On the pound yen, we had that break to the upside. Obviously, a pullback back right into that zone and then a move right into that um, target area to, to, to basically take off the trade from. So there's an example that worked out yesterday waiting for a pullback. Um, obviously a break and then a pullback. Uh, I think we had the same type of setup on the pound US dollar as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it might have been this break and that pullback. I'm not exactly sure. Was it the euro? There was a couple of examples of of, um, of pullbacks that worked out yesterday. Now, the thing to keep in mind, Mohammed, is that um, knowing when to trade from a pullback, knowing when to trade from a breakout is going to be mainly due to the sentiment that you're trading. And whether the sentiment is strong enough for you to enter um, at market or whether the sentiment um, will allow you to wait for a possible pullback. Now, if we just take something like the pound versus the yen yesterday, we had an upside bias in the pay already. Um, and we waited for an initial pullback, I think, to somewhere in this area yesterday, um, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was somewhere in that area waiting for a pullback. Um, now, what happened, obviously, we had that big break to the upside on the uh, the Brexit news. So we did another video saying that, okay, we're now breaking above that 132.50 zone. This is a critical level from a resistance point of view. So we're not going to be waiting for a pullback all the way back down to the 132 or 131.90 area. We can wait for a break, a pullback into that zone, and then re-engage the page to the upside. So this, this exact trade is one that I took myself yesterday. Um, and the reason why we waited for a pullback was because at that time, breaking above that level, we were already above the ADR high for the day. So you always need to consider not only the sentiment itself that you're trading, but um, how far the pairs already moved in terms of, uh, of, the, of, of your, your daily range. So of course, when you have a very strong catalyst coming into the market, you are bound to move outside of your daily range, right? So you're bound to move above your ADR high or below your ADR low. Um, that is bound to happen. But the moment when you exceed that, you, 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 you always need to consider the probabilities of what is going to happen next. So the moment when you move past your ADR, the moment when you break through psychological levels, when you extend it like that, the highest probability at that point is to expect the market to pull back um, instead of continuing to the upside. Now, sometimes you might miss a pullback. Uh, where the market just continued upside. Uh, I think the Aussie yen was a good example. I think it just went up and up and up. Um, even the even the Kiwi yen was a good example yesterday. So there was there was just no opportunity for you to get in from a pullback on any of that move to the upside. Um, and that is going to happen. Sometimes you're not going to get that pullback. Um, the thing that you need to ask yourself when you're in that situation. So when you get to your screen. And you are, let's say you, you're in this area over here and you've already passed your ADR. Let's say your ADR is sitting somewhere in that level um, and you're getting close to a significant level, which is the 65, um, 6550. The question you need to ask yourself, what is the highest probability for this pair to do from here? So of course, with the sentiment in line, the expectation is for it to move to the upside, definitely. But just because the sentiment says upside or downside is there, doesn't mean that the probability in terms of the, uh, the price action is necessarily there at that time. So when something happens when you can just jump into the market, is if we go back to the pound, um, we were obviously waiting for a pullback in the pound. Now, when you got the news of the Brexit, um, positive comments from Brexit, that could have been an excellent example for you to just jump in at, um, at market. So not waiting for a pullback, you could have just jumped in at that news 
because the sentiment allowed you to, to basically enter at market. There was another driver that is causing upside. Now, if we didn't get that, if we didn't get the Brexit news and there wasn't that further momentum to the upside, then there was a very high probability that we might have seen the pair reach this level, pull back, and then only move to the upside again. So we always, always, always need to consider what is the, uh, not only the sentiment for the pair, but what is the highest probability um, for the price action once the pair has already moved in a particular direction. So let's say something massive happens over the Asia session and you get to your screen. Let's just take these ones away. So let's just, let's just imagine that this, this entire move happens during the Asia session. When you get to your screen and it's already moved up by that much, sure, if the sentiment shows up, you can always just enter at market and trade it to the upside. Um, but you're basically trading against the overall probabilities of you doing that. You're trading in line with the sentiment, but you're not giving the market, you're, not, you're entering basically, um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to buy at the highs and sell at the lows, right? So you always want um, the sentiment to be in line, but you also want to be buying from uh, good areas and selling from good areas. So you want to be buying when it's, um, overvalued, so to speak, and you want to be um, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, selling when it's overvalued and buying when it's undervalued. So you're always looking for value when you when you when you trade uh, sentiment shift. So where can I get the most value from that trade? So yesterday, for example, buying it right at the highs um, before the Brexit announcement wouldn't have really given you uh, a lot of value because the pair already moved um, and reached the ADR high. But with that Brexit announcement coming out, then bang, okay, another value point that you can enter from. So um, don't only look at it from a sentiment point of view, also look at it from a, um, from a uh, probability point of view as well. What is the highest probability for that pair to, um, uh, to go from there based on the sentiment that's in the market? We also have a quick question here from JP. Um, are we still likely to see a move to the upside for the euro yen uh, to the 119, 150 mark intraday? Let's quickly have a look and see where we're tracking with the euro yen. Um, 119. Okay, so that's going to be right above there. Come on. So um, for now, JP, the bias is obviously to the upside um, with, the, with the positivity being priced into the euro and with the hopes of the recovery fund. We, are, we do have a, an upside bias. We're also seeing that overall risk on tone. So we expect strength for the euro and we expect weakness for the yen. Obviously, whether it will reach that level will depend on uh, the actual sentiment, how the sentiment plays out. Um, in terms of whether the, whether we can see agreement, if we reach agreement, uh, we can see it break well above, uh, in my opinion, uh, well above that 119 level. Obviously, going back to the uh, to these highs we had back on the 7th of April as well as the 9th of April. So a very important level from a technical point of view um, for topside resistance. So if we do get a, a, a unanimous decision uh, in its current form, I think we can break well past that level in today's session, to be honest. Obviously, based on the nuances that's there, if we get it in the current 750 billion um, form, then yes, I think we can break above. If it's a lower type of uh, agreement, then we might not get that. Uh, but I, I, would, I would assume it breaking above um, that level, maybe even reaching, um, possibly maybe even reaching 120 in today's session. And going back to the highs of the 31st, uh, obviously depending on on on, on the outcome, um, but I think that's a very good resistance area to have in mind. If you're already trading this to the upside, um, I think that is a very good spot to to look to reduce some risk and bank some pips. Just keep in mind that right now we're waiting for the market to we're waiting for the eurozone to actually um, make its decision, the member states. So it it can also reverse quite quickly if we see a, a broad rejection across the board um, for the recovery plan, uh, we can easily see some downside coming back into the equity space, which should see some strength coming back into the, uh, into the yen as a safe payment. So it can also see lots of downside. Um, but I'll say that's a, good, that's a good upside target to keep in mind um, for the pay in today's session. Okay, awesome, Nick, no worries. 
Um, Daniel is asking, what time frame should we use if we want to trade breakouts? So, um, Daniel, when it comes to when when it comes to the more um, the the more technical technical side of of um, of trading, you know, whether it's um, whether you're looking at support and resistance or you're looking at um, trend lines or, or those type of things, even candlesticks, etc. Um, my rule has always been to keep things as simple as possible. So when I when I used to trade without the the fundamentals, I used to do I don't know hours and days and days worth of analysis. You know, going through the chart on the one minute and the five and the fifteen and the thirty and going like all the way to the weekly and then moving back down again and looking at various candles on various time frames and all that. And you know what? Personally, for me, that's it. It's it's a lot of work for very low return. Uh, return on your investment in terms of the time that you spend on it. So my my golden rule for stuff like that is trade um, the breakout on the time frame that you're trading. So if you're trading on the M30, trade a breakout from a level on the M30. Or um, if you're looking at a very key daily level, for example. So if you're looking at a key daily level. So yesterday we had the um, we had the S and P, for example. Trying to uh, trying that three thousand level, and what a lot of traders were looking for is basically a daily close above the three thousand. That was a very key close, and the market actually failed to close above um, the three thousand. But not really seeing a rejection from that level, we're seeing just a move to the upside. So, uh, if you're looking at a daily level, you know you 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 can consider a daily close or above. But generally speaking, if you're trading it from a from anything below that, you know, j- just just keep it on the time frame that you're trading. If you're trading it on the M30, wait for a break there. If you're trading it on the M15, because if you if you try and go too granular with it, where where do you where do you draw the line? So, I mean, obviously, if you look at a 15 minute, you might have a breakout on a 15 minute chart, um, but if you think about it. A breakout on the 15-minute chart might just be a reversal candle on the M30 because if you, you you might break out and you might have that candle, the next one retrace the entire move. And now you're sitting with a pin bar looking bar on the M30. So now you can say, okay, now I'm going to wait for a breakout on the M30 and the M30 breaks out. And then suddenly the next M30 candle pulls back and now you're sitting with a pin bar on the H1. So you get what I'm saying is eventually you're going to be, you're going to be so granular that it, it just, it just, you, you, you'll you'll basically have it's the law of diminished returns. You're going to f- be so focused on it that you actually miss the entire move um, if you just stuck to a, a simple plan with it. So my golden rule with it is just keep it as simple as possible. If you're trading it on the M30, then trade it on the M30. Uh, I mean, something that that normally blows a lot of retail traders' minds is when they when they find out that a lot of uh, majority of the um, professional traders out there don't even use candlesticks. They just use line charts because they're just looking at key levels um, and they're trading from uh, from value positions, right? So um, think about it always in that way that the, the, the there's, there's lots of value in looking at those type of things, but don't let it be your, um, like don't let, don't let it be this, you know, all encompassing thing that, uh, that, that forces you from not taking trades or taking trades. Just keep it very, very simple. It's a good golden rule that I've uh, that I've normally stuck with. Uh, Cortez, what is your view on the Kiwi yen? Let's quickly have a look at the Kiwi yen. So in today's session, Cortez definitely still an upside bias in the pair. Um, let me just quickly see something from this. Yeah, I thought that was a little bit high. That's better. Okay, so looking at the Kiwi yen. Definitely an upside bias as long as the risk tone stays positive. So currently looking at all of the um, different asset classes, we can see equity markets are just rip-roaring to the upside on the back of that European Commission news. We can see bond yields also breaking out to fresh highs, further downside seen in the BTB. Uh, Looking over to the commodity space, uh, not a lot of confirmation there, but still um, 
more sideways movements from WTI and Brent crude, but not too concerned about that. We are seeing upside in, in copper, which is a more important one for overall risk sentiment in, in terms of commodity space. So definitely still seeing an overall risk on tone. As long as that is the case, the bias for the pair is definitely to, uh, to the upside. So let's just see from a technical point of view um, where a couple of key levels are for us just to focus on. Um, I think looking at that high will be important, coming in very close to that 67.50. Uh, currently, we're also testing that 67 level, uh, which is also an important one that we need to keep in mind. So, I mean, as far as, as resistance goes, um, if you're already in this trade to the upside, uh, I would probably look to uh, bank some pips at this stage, or if not, just reduce some risk on this trade. Um, I think this is an overall good, uh, good area to consider for some, uh, for some resistance in the pair. And then, of course, if you're looking to still get long on it, I won't. I won't really buy it now um, at the session highs. Um, I'll probably wait for a pullback. And if we have a look at the um, at the chart, I'll say anything between the 66, let's call it 66.70, or let's say 66.60 and 66.50 um, looks like a good opportunity to be able to re-engage the pair from. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say. Also, that's what I'm that I'm looking at for now, uh, Cortez. So definitely upside bias, but won't be won't be looking to buy it right now. Um, okay, we have a quick question from Alexander. Uh, what is the significance, if any, of the fix? Um, I have a rough understanding of what they are. Can't find much info online aside from the stories about the fix manipulation in London. Over the last few days, I've seen several news feeds uh, about the Juan fix, and it really sparked my interest in the topic. Uh, do you know of any good resource to learn from? Yeah, we actually did a couple of videos on it, um, Alexander. So uh, we did one on the London fix specifically. Um, so if you go to the terminal in the video commentary section, if you just type in, in the search bar, if you type in London fix, um, you should see the video that we did about the London fix. And we also did one about the um, US dollar, the Chinese uh, midpoint, the Xuan midpoint fix. And uh, we also did a video about that, I think about a week ago. Um, so you can definitely check that out. Uh, one that I'm meaning to make as well is just having a, a little bit more of a, um, a detailed look at the, the different cash opens. So obviously with the cash opens being very focused on, on risk sentiment, we need to know about the, um, the, the, the uh, let's call it the, the volume changes that we often get when we have cash open. So when we have the European cash open and the New York cash open, um, you can sometimes see uh, a, not sometimes, you usually see a big increase in terms of the volume if you compare the futures market. So um, let me give you guys a quick example of that. So let's, let's just add in volume here. Yeah. What you'll normally see is you're going to see a huge blip just go to the H4. You'll normally see if you just quickly go back here, you're either gonna get a big volume spike just as your session starts, whenever you have your, your cash open, and then you should normally get a, um, a, a spike just at the close. So that's basically your, uh, your pre-market orders as it gets into the markets, obviously gonna create some volume in terms of equities, and that can usually suck a couple of of, uh, of currency traders in as well, because they might see, wow, okay, breakouts to the upside in terms of equity markets, but it might just be pre-market orders that gets uh, initiated at the cash open. And then of course, lots of traders that wants to um, get in um, just before the market closes, um, also adding in a couple of positions. So you normally see that spike um, of volume just at the cash open, and then a spike of volume just as it closes. So those are a couple of important things to keep in mind. Um, just, I think the golden rule for that is always remember not to, don't get sucked into, um, into spikes whenever you have a cash open and a cash close. You can expect some volume there. Uh, so always just keep that in mind um, uh, for, for risk sentiments. You might be seeing strong risk on tone and then suddenly 
cash open comes and then equity markets just moves down across the board. Now that might cause a couple of nervous traders to exit their position saying, oh, sure, but the market's going risk off, but it might not be going risk off. It might just be that cash open or that cash close causing that uh, volume spike. So something to keep in mind, but for the, for the two fixes, the London fix and then the, um, uh, the midpoint fix for the Schwann, uh, just type that into the, into the search bar um, of the video commentary and you'll be able to, um, um, to watch uh, two videos on those ones. Okay, awesome, JP, no worries. Um, Mohammed, um, no worries, man. You can ask as many questions as you like. Um, there's no limit. Uh, what is the best time frame of charts to use for a day trader? So, I mean, for me, I like using the 30 minutes and there's no, there's absolutely no secret sauce um, in it. So there's there's no, you know, secret um uh, uh, significance to the M30. For me, what I like about the M30, um, I might have changed the time frame to M15 if I had lesser charts on the screen. So what I like about the M30 is with ha having eight charts on the screen, it gives me a, a um, it shows me what I want to see. So I want to see yesterday's price action. Sometimes I might want to see the day before that. And I want to obviously see what's going on today. Um, I want to be able to see uh, any significant levels that I have on the chart. So M30 for me from a, from a day trading perspective is great because I get to see whatever I want to see. I get a, 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 a little bit smaller view or granular view of price action, but also get a view of the, the previous price action from the, from the um, last two sessions. So I like the M15. I know uh, Jared usually traded on the 15 minute from an intraday perspective. Um, it's, it's really, there's, there's no, um, there's no secret source really. It's um, it, it's, it's basically for me just, the M30, I like it because I, I can see whatever I want to see with it. But um, there's, no, um, there's no perfect one, really. Um, Nick, I don't know, do you know what time the EU is likely to confirm the recovery plan? You know what? I've been asking a couple of the analysts, um, and we haven't, we haven't gotten a time yet. Where well, there we go. No, okay, that's on bonds. Um, I don't think we have a a time yet for that one, unfortunately, um, Nick. But we'll definitely once we once we find out, we'll just we'll just uh, post it in. Um, if anybody in the fee uh, in the webinar knows, I mean that'll be great if you guys can share that info. Um, but so far, I don't think we've we've received a time yet for it. Uh, Kevin is asking who is actually moving the market, uh, who is buying equities and high beta currencies causing a positive sentiment when it's clearly doom and gloom, uh, can it be the Fed, it's clearly not the retailers, um, who then who is this mysterious <laughs> Mr. Market. So remember that it's always, it's never just one person, so you don't have a guy uh, sitting there with trillions uh, that that's moving the market it's, it's always going to be the the collective move um of the market overall and the biggest players of course is going to be your um definitely your commercial banks um and other big players out there um hedge funds and, and prop firms etc the, the players that really has the the capital to move the market now um the, there's there's lots of reasons um for why why equities have been moving up why high bait high betas have been moving up um, for more information on on the the positive and negative catalyst, you can just watch the or uh, the week eight video, or just check out the top trading opportunities report. So we highlighted the the more positive flows that we've seen and the more negative flows that we've seen. Um, the the one thing that's interesting, um, Kevin, from a from a um, equity point of view, is that the the market is still net short. So in terms of speculative positioning. Um, the market is still priced for for lower moves in uh, in equities, and positioning isn't everything, uh, but it's very important when you have uh, when you have a pain trade like this going on because the higher this thing gets, um, the more squeeze it's going to cause. So I think a lot of that initial upside we saw after that um, uh, downside, a lot of that initial move, apart from all the positive catalysts that we had, like the Fed announcing unlimited QE. I mean that was a massive. Uh, uh, massive announcements, also 
um, announcing corporate bond purchases, et cetera. All of the stimulus is one of it. The positive thing about the virus actually uh, coming down in term of, uh, terms of um, uh, the epicenters and the, the progress made being with the drugs. Now, yes, the hard data has been bad, but a lot of that was priced in. Um, at this stage, I, I agree with you. I think there's, there's lots of downside left um, in terms of the actual data. There's many things that hasn't been priced in yet. Um, solvency is a huge one right now, which the market just is, is largely discounting um, the mass mass uh, solvency issue that, uh, that the globe is facing after this, um, uh, this downturn. So there's lots of things that still need to be priced in. So I mean, I agree with you. It's all doom and gloom, but there is reasons for the markets moving up, uh, even if it's just on the positioning side. A lot aside, a lot of squeezing happening. So think about it this this way, right? When we were at the end of March, in this zone, we we had something like a uh, four and a half um, standard deviation move um, to the downside for. Uh, for negative pricing for the S&P. Now, on a Z-score basis, four and a half, that's huge. That's huge. So think about it. Four, four, times, um, four times away from the standard deviation is how far the markets were negatively priced for equities after we had that initial drop. Uh, and that is when we had that move to the upside. So what happens when the market is so negatively priced is obviously you open the door for a squeeze. And what a squeeze is basically is you get a positive catalyst, and the market starts to move up. And a lot of the play players that sold over here, obviously their stops is gonna be over here. So when, the moment when those stops get hit, obviously that's gonna create a counter move in the market. So you see more momentum to the upside. So you, you have a positive catalyst, now you have stops being hit. And apart from that, you've got a lot of um, uh, chases out there that's basically trying to chase the move and they're trying to hedge against the sell order they have sitting. So they're losing money on the sell. So they wanna please their, um, uh, their they desk manager, so they're trying to hedge that negative position by actually buying the market. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of squeezing going on as well. Um, a lot of traders actually noticing the fact that last week's uh, Moderna move to the upside, I mean, that was a massive, massive move. And a lot of them are saying that that was, that was probably some of the last um, uh, remaining uh, sell orders being squeezed out of the market. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind. But the other thing that I want to just, you know, add to your question on, on who's buying it is there's, there's lots, of, lots of traders out there um, uh, that's very divided on, on where they think the market is going. So there's, there's always going to be bulls and bears. You're going to have your perma bulls and your perma bears. Now, the bulls, obviously, um, especially the ones that's very active on Twitter, you know, um, all of them bought right at the low always. <laughs> you know, you're always going to get... Uh, the guy's quiet forever and then suddenly, you know, he bought at the lows. So he sold over here um, and it's going to be the same guy that also, you know, bought over here, those perfect traders. So you're going to, you're going to have a lot of perma bulls that's already long this market from a long time ago. Whether it's been the actual low, doesn't matter. There's going to be a lot of perma bulls that's coming back into the market that's calling for a more forward looking outlook right now, saying that we need to look past the negative data, we need to look past everything and start looking at 2021. So to a large degree, um, a lot of people are still expecting downside from the uh, second quarter earnings season coming up, but there's a lot of negative expectations of that already. So, you know, how much of, the, how much of that negative um, quarter two earnings, how much of that is gonna have an effect if everybody expects it to be very, very, very bad. So the expectations running into it is always gonna be very important. So for me, I agree with you. I think it is, uh, if, if we want to label it that way, I think it is more, more doom and gloom than the unicorn and marshmallow theme that's going on right now. Um, but you also don't want to be catching a falling knife right now. So there's, there is reasons for the market going up and we need to be aware of them and be careful not to, not to get caught. The, 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 the one area where you don't want to be, you, you don't want to be on the wrong side of a bear market bounce because these things are violent. We've seen it, we've seen it happen um, over this last couple of weeks. So um, for me, that the best way to approach this market right now, especially from the equity side and how that affects the currency moves is I'm not looking for any medium term positions right now. Uh, I'm playing this from a very short term basis, very close to the chest. 
keeping a very close eye um, on the, the overall risk factors, keeping my risk low and jumping in on very clear um, catalysts that I think has some momentum to the up or to the downside. And that's basically where, um, where I think that the best place is to, to have your risk right now. Um, not, not, trying to be, not trying to be a euro um, on, any of, uh, on any of these trades right now. Okay, awesome, Daniel, no worries. Always, always a pleasure there, uh, Cortez, as well as Alexander and Mohammed. Um, so we have a question here from Sergey. Can we please have a look at the Aussie yen? Yeah, sure. Let's quickly have a look at the Aussie yen. Um, you know what might be better for us to do is let's just have a look at all the risk sensitive ones. Um, we should see some nice momentum to the upside across the board. Yeah, nice momentum to the upside uh, on most of them in line of those risk flows. Um, so let's see Aussie yen. So the important level that we highlighted yesterday was that 7150. If we just go back, that was basically the highest going all the way back before the, the crash started. So having broken above that level, I think that is a very, very significant level that we need to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to keep in mind for the, for the Aussie yen as well as the Aussie dollar is just always having a look at the S&P. So going to have a strong correlation between those two. So as long as the S&P is breaking and creating fresh highs, um, I'm expecting the Aussie yen to follow that to the upside. So one thing that we can look from a technical perspective is try and look for some um, uh, possible confluence areas for, for both of them. So looking at the S&P, an obvious level for the market to want to retest would probably be the 3,000, maybe below that, let's say between the 2980 and the, and the 3,000 level. Now, if we just look at the chart, that move to the downside should coincide also with a move to the downside in the, in the Aussie yen, maybe to the 7150, maybe even the 70. Uh, 71 flat. So uh, I think this overall zone uh, from an equ equity point of view is a good area to watch for the Aussie yen. Um, in today's session, of course, definitely seeing some downside, uh, as, um, sorry, some further upside in, long, uh, in line with the risk sentiment. I think where we're currently trading is a good spot to at least reduce some risk if you're already long. Getting close to that 72 psychological level as well as the ADR high and also seeing um, the equity space um, not pulling back, but we, we are off the session high. So um, I'll probably look for some profit taking or, or reducing risk close to that 72. Uh, and if the, if the risk zone stays positive, uh, we could wait for a possible pullback to that 7150. And that can also create a nice opportunity to, uh, to the upside. Um, Daniel, uh, what are signs you use to determine that sentiment has shifted as opposed to simply taking a small hit? So um, the, the, the first one, obviously, um, Daniel's always going to be when the, the actual, when the reason why you entered changes. So for example, let's say you entered the, um, the euro. Let's say you entered the euro at the news of the uh, EU commission. So you, you got full, let's say, at the uh, 0970 area. So when you want to, when the sentiment changes is when something negative comes out with regards to that momentum. So let's say some of the frugal states, you know, decides they're not going to go with the announcement or the announcement comes out, but it's lesser than the markets are currently pricing in. That's obviously going to be a good spot for you to liquidate that position. In terms of risk sentiment trades, um, obviously when something happens, when a catalyst comes out that negates your um, your reason for entering or reason for trading, that's always going to be a good spot to, to rather get out and liquidate. Um, if there's no change in the actual catalyst, so if there's no counter catalyst coming out, um, that's normally the more tricky one to establish because then you're going to be, uh, if it's risk down, you're going to be, ne you, you, you need to watch everything the whole time. So you need to watch when the equity markets are starting to moderate. So let's say you have a strong up or strong down move. Uh, is it starting to move down from the highs or up from the lows? Is it starting to, uh, uh, to pull back what's happening to yields across the board, what's happening to uh, commodities across the board. So if there's no change in the catalyst, you always need to just be uh, making sure that you're having a look across global macro, seeing if there's any major 
um, moves across the asset classes that, that, that might be affecting that trade. Sometimes there's no change in the catalyst. The market just moderates. So, you know, sometimes you, you have a big move to the upside um, and without a catalyst, the market just pulls back because pullbacks are normal. So it can be, it can be tricky. Um, that's one of the reasons from a, from a more short-term perspective, why I like to, when I've reached a certain level um, with, with a trade, uh, getting close to something like that 72, if I'm trading this to the upside, um, let's say you got a great full and you entered you know, somewhere in this area when, when the announcement came out. Um, if I'm in this trade and it's moved to the upside um, and I'm getting close to that level, I'm already going to be at break even right now. So I'm probably already, I'm either going to have a, have, have a very tight stop right now, or I'm going to be a uh, break even on this trade. Um, look, not looking to, to take a, a knock if the sentiment starts to fade. If the sentiment comes down, of course, uh, if it's just a moderation and, I'm getting, and I get taked out of this trade, um, I can always just re-enter from a better price if the sentiment is still intact. So it, it's not like you, you're always losing out. Um, if, if it's a big move like this to the upside due to something like the, the, the euro move, for example, when something as big as that happens um, and I'm close to a level and we're waiting for like the EU commission, um, I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably look to maybe even take profit. Um, um, at a level like that, if, if it's getting close to a, to, a, to a very significant level, there's obviously going to be differences. But I think for the most part, that's, um, uh, th that's always a good gauge. Sometimes the market just moderates. So in those type of moderation um, events, there's no easy way of knowing, okay, I'm out. I mean, um, it's always going to be a little bit of, a, um, you know, of, of keeping your finger on the pulse. The moment when you, you see it moderates strongly. It's maybe just time to to liquidate that position and and wait for a, for a better um, either better entry or a new catalyst to drive it. Okay, cool. Dudley is saying um, further to Nick's question. The uh, we have von der Leyen coming out at twelve thirty BST. Um, for remarks, um, and that should be, I think that's now, right? I think that is now. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is the actual announcement. I think that is, that might just be the actual announcement of the proposal. Um, I don't think the, the, the states have already deliberated on it, but we just need to pay attention. If, if it is 130, um, we just need to be very, very um, weary. Um, will the team update us on the pound position trades or do we have to keep a mental note when the market approaches the price? Um, Jean-Pierre, I'm actually not sure which ones you're talking about. Can you just give me some more information on, on those ones? Uh, Cortez, what is your view on the Aussie dollar? For, for now, Cortez, as long as the risk tone remains positive, um, an upside bias. But again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very careful of jumping in on this right now. Um, we've already seen quite a big move um, across the board. If we do get a confirmation that, um, you know, that, that off, uh, across the board acceptance of the deal, then I'll probably look to jump into something like the, the Aussie dollar because that should see further moves to the upside for the euro and further moves to the downside for the dollar. So there can be an opportunity. But for now, uh, I'm still sticking to a more sideways bias, to be honest. Um, there is upside as long as the risk tone remains positive. Um, I'm just a little bit cautious on, um, on whether we get that, um, whether the, the 27 member states can agree on that. A quick question from Steve. I'm doing great. Thanks, Steve. Hope you're doing well as well. Um, can we quickly have a look at the Aussie dollar above? Break above 66.75. Let's quickly have a look at 66.75. That should be around about. Okay, so yesterday's high uh, with a target of 67. 10-ish uh, risk mood. 
shoot the risk. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a that's a good way of looking at it, Steve. If we if we can break above, um, I think a break above can see a further leg to the upside. Let's see what we're looking at from a higher time frame. Yeah, um, we do have that and um, that high going back to the what's that the 9th of March, which is good. Very very important level this one if we do break. So we can see that. Um, that's uh, 66.75, also lots of support in the pair. So if we can break above there, we might even, 67 is a good one. We might extend it even a little bit, like you said, maybe the 67.10. Um, yeah, I, th I think intraday, those are good levels to watch, mate. Um, yeah, I like that. If, 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 if risk uh, gives us the opportunity, I think that's a, that's a good way to, to look at it. Or a, a move to the downside, obviously, will will be will be great as well um but yeah a break a break above um can be interesting to the upside for that one uh jean-pierre uh, in terms of brexit how will the euro be affected uh good question so if we if we get further positive comments coming out from the UK side, we should see um, upside for both. Now the thing just to keep in mind about the the pound and the euro is if it's extremely positive news or extremely negative news, it's obviously in terms of Brexit, it's obviously going to affect the pound a lot more than the euro. Now what sometimes happens is that because you have the uh, the euro pound pair, it's a very very important pair. What happens when you have strong moves in the pound from Brexit, you often see the opposite type of move in the, uh, sometimes in the euro because of how the euro pound moves. So theoretically, good news should be, should be good for both, but we do need to keep in mind how it affects the, the euro pound pair um, as that can actually affect the, um, uh, the euro overall as well. So definitely something that I'll just consider as, a, consider as an add-on there. Uh, pound yen on May the 1st. Okay, okay, okay. Let's quickly have a look at the trade ideas. May the 1st. There we go. So position trade. So shorting the pound yen from between 155 and 160. Uh, let's just quickly see what the analyst's rationale was. So the long-term outlook for the pound remains particularly bleak. Uh, with the shutdown, mm, okay, recession fears, Brexit deal, okay, so the economy will likely um, come under pressure, likely take years until the economy recovers if we have a, a no deal. Um, as such, we expect currency pairs such as the pound to find substantial offers at key levels of resistance and we pound is likely to be considered comparatively expensive. The clearest level would be between the high of 2018, 155 and 2009, 160. So let's quickly take a look. So um, the, the, in terms of the, the overall rationale, um, I do still agree with that. Uh, Jean-Pierre, let's just quickly get the pound yen up. Just the one thing to, to, to keep in mind though, is that being the yen, um, the, the the challenge we have is is overall risk sentiment in the market. So, um, as as long as equities continue their their momentum to the upside, um, you know whether whether it's 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 rightly placed or not, that's that's going to see further upside for something like the pound yen. So, whether the pound is weak or not, the yen should be uh, should stay a pressure on the back of equities moving higher. So keep that in mind. Um, looking, looking at it from a, from a position point of view, let's just see. So we're looking at one, it's a quite, quite a big position. Just see 155, 160. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's very far away. Um, 155. Yeah, so it's the highest from 2018. And then, um, I mean, it, it's it's so far away right now, Jean-Pierre. I mean, when we get closer to that area, I think 
you know, from a, from a position point of view, it's going to be much better to, to evaluate it from, um, with, if all else remains equal, um, I think looking for, for short term downside in the pound yen is, is definitely valid. Um, especially eyeing something like that 136 level. I think that's going to be interesting. Now, again, I'm not going to sell just because we reached that level. We should have a reason for, for the market to want to sell it from that level. Just something to keep in mind is, you know, the, 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 the Brexit negotiations are going to be very important. So we've already seen the EU, we're seeing a similar story unfold than what we saw uh, with the prior Brexit agreement, with the withdrawal, uh, withdrawal agreement. It was hardline, 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 hardline. And then all of a sudden, you know, they started to make a breakthrough. So the, we had a concession and then another concession, another concession. And suddenly, you know, three weeks later, not even, I mean, two weeks later, we have a withdrawal agreement in place. So um, a lot can happen in a very short space of time. Um, and I mean, 155 is, is, is miles away um, right now. Obviously, it's a position trade. So that's going to be something you're not going to look to hold for a week or a month or two months, it's something that you're going to be holding for a couple of months at a time. So um, I think when we get closer to that levels, um, depending on what happens to Brexit in the short term, that'll give us a, a better idea of, um, of, uh, of the stance on, on that particular um, trade idea. Uh, the remainder, uh, any idea of what levels we can be looking at for the euro US dollar if wanting to fade the move? So let's quickly have a look. Um, there's actually a few that I'm looking at um, myself right now. I mean, 110 obviously was a key level uh, from a resistance point of view. Now, we basically slice through it very easily, um, but we are currently still at these elevated highs that we need to keep in mind. So going back to uh, the 110.50, uh, what is that? That's at the... Uh, on the 20th of May. And if we have a look just above that, going back to the to the 31st of March, we're getting very close to that 1150 level. So it depends. Right now, the levels for me are, are, are less important on, on what than what the actual news is and what the actual um, agreement is on, on how they how they're going to plan to to take it forward. Um, but I mean, f let's say it comes out negative and we have a complete rejection of it. Um, I'm expecting the entire move firstly to be, to be faded. So uh, I think the first port of call would be session lows to look for, a potential first target maybe. And then in terms of a second target, we could look for something like the 109. Um, as that'll basically put us back to exactly where we were before the announcement. So um, I think those are the two key levels from an intraday perspective that I'll look at. Uh, if it's a fading move to to the downside, to the upside, however, uh, first one one uh, uh, one ten fifty, uh, going back to these highs, uh, we can see this is a very interesting area from both support and a resistance point of view. Um, so anything between the one ten forty and one ten sixty, I think, is a very attractive area to consider for upside targets. The first one, at least, and if it's a unanimous decision coming in, you know, completely accepting. It in its current form at 750 billion, much bigger than the prior um, uh, prior uh, proposal. Um, we might even, you know, it's gonna. It might take a while, maybe a couple of sessions. But I think then the next target that we're holding out for can be something close to the 111.50. Um, just from purely technical level, so a couple of couple of upside and downside ones we're looking at. Uh, but from a, from a, from a short term point of view to the upside, watch out for 11050 to the downside. I think the first one will be 1950 and then followed by the, by the 109. Okay. So I think we threw the Q and a box guys. Let me just quickly um, move over to the chat. Uh, could be had Shane's one in the chat. So we have a question from Honto um, with the possibility of sentiment changing throughout the day. Is it possible to have an indicator in the terminal to show the current sentiment? Honto, that's that is actually one of the um, one of the new features that our development team is working on. Apart from that, there's there's a couple of awesome other features in the pipeline as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any timeline on, on when that thing will be ready, but a lot, a lot, a lot of work has already been done on that. So 
it's definitely in the pipeline. Definitely something we uh, we're working hard on to uh, uh, to get uh, available for you guys. Um, Gideon, what is the ADR for? So Gideon, the ADR is basically just a, um, a gauge. So we, we have a look back of 10 days on that one. It's just a quick um, volatility gauge of the expected volatility moves we can expect from any given instrument um, based on the last 10 sessions or the last two weeks of price action. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an intraday volatility gauge um, estimating what the highest probability high and highest probability low is based on the last two weeks worth of uh, worth of volatility. Okay, awesome, Dominic. Always, always a pleasure, mate. Um, okay, guys, thanks for the for the questions. I'm going to quickly pop over to the um, to the YouTube side or Facebook side. Let me just see where the guys loaded this. Um, okay, <laughs> quite a couple of questions here on the uh, on the YouTube side. Very welcome to everybody once again uh, from the from the broader community. Let me just quickly um, go through a few, a few of these questions. Um, okay, we have a first question here. Um, is it Ashish uh, saying, does the presence of stimulus in the currency increase the strength of a particular currency? That is a, it's actually a great question, uh, Ashish. And it, it will be different. Um, it will be different depending on the type of environment that we're trading in. So currently, if you, if you hear that a um, central bank will buy assets or, or, or increase an asset purchase program or, or have a... Um, a stimulus measure in place, that's usually going to be negative for your currency, uh, especially if it's in the form of QE and, and those type of stimulus. Now, what makes something like the recovery fund a little bit different is that is a, um, it's, it's not stimulus in the form of um, asset purchases, it's stimulus in the form of debt sales. So they're trying to basically issue more debt um, so that's going to basically, they're basically going to borrow money from the rest of the world who wants to buy the bonds and they're going to take that money and then obviously give it in the form of either loans or grants to the, to the different member states. And the reason why in this particular instance, it's going to be positive for the euro and why it is positive for, um, for things like Italian yields um, uh, or, or uh, bonds rather is because it decreases the risk of, of defaulting. So there's a lot of default risk in terms uh, of the eurozone. We had Greece uh, being bailed out during the previous um, debt crisis back in 2012. There's a lot of risk still in play with nations like Italy, like Spain. So it's a good thing for them. Uh, now, there's obviously a difference also between fiscal stimulus and monetary policy stimulus. So whenever you have fiscal stimulus, which is actual spending, tax cuts, et cetera, uh, to, some, to some degree, your, your um, recovery fund falls into more of a fiscal um, on the fiscal side, that's normally going to be a positive for your economy because you, you, you're basically providing funds to expand and spend. Uh, where it, when you go to monetary policy, whenever you have stimulus there, that's basically um, the central bank trying to increase the money supply in the economy, basically decreasing the, the value of the currency, trying to devalue it. And obviously, alongside softer monetary policy, you also have uh, things like QE that tries to basically exacerbate that. So always, always when you're looking at stimulus, always ask yourself, is this, is this fiscal stimulus or is this monetary policy stimulus? If it's fiscal, it should be uh, supportive for your currency. And if it is um, monetary policy stimulus, it should be more negative. Now, also keep in mind when it comes to fiscal, fiscal can to some extent also be negative. Uh, and that we explained uh, in terms of the Euro Recovery Fund, if the entire, whether it's 500 or 750 billion, if everything is only released in terms of debt, then that's actually going to be um, negative for countries like uh, Italy because that's basically just going to increase their debt burden. So always keep something like your, your, where the country is in terms of its debt, always keep that in mind for stimulus, because the type of stimulus they get can actually have a negative impact as well, even if it is fiscal. And we have a question from Joe. When checking sentiment, do you read bonds, stocks, and commodities news, or do you just look at the green and red table? 
Um, no, we, 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 we look at the, the underlying drivers as well, definitely, Joe. So um, as a quick gauge, obviously, it's, it's, it's very easy to have a quick look over yields and a quick look over equities and a quick look over, uh, over commodities across the board. Um, but uh, we, we also look at the underlying factors. So um, just because it's a risk on tone doesn't mean that WTI and Brent crude will go up. So there might be supply and demand factors that's obviously going to um, uh, uh, change your outlook for something like uh, like oil prices. Gold, obviously, the main driver there. Yes, it's a safe haven, but the actual driver for gold um, isn't isn't the US dollar. Yes, in the short term, it isn't risk sentiment. Yes, it is in the short term, but the medium term um, driver for gold price is actually real interest rates. So you always need to consider the actual underlying drivers as well. Uh, but from a from a just a pure short term point of view, um, getting confirmation of a risk tone is is always valuable at looking just looking at the the, the quick intraday performance. So are yields moving higher? Is equities moving higher? Is your risk sensitive commodities moving higher? That's normally a good sign for positive risk tone, positive risk appetite. And then of course the vice versa is also true. We we actually did a video um, I think last week. It's called uh, I think the ultimate guide to risk sentiment or something like that. Um, so maybe you can just check that one out, Joe. It should give you a, a little bit more of a, a bigger picture view of, um, uh, of, uh, of what we just explained. Gregory, where do you see the outcomes of uh, the discussion? So, I mean, for, for me, um, from a humanitarian point of view, I really hope that they can get this agreement across because the eurozone really needs it. Um, but from a from a purely from a purely analyst point of view, um, I think it's a very high hurdle for them to cross today. Um, the, the frugal guys really, really don't want the, the the size at 500 billion was already an issue for them. So adding another 250 billion. You know, it's it, it's pushing it now. Think about it in terms of discussions, right? So the European Commission they could have yeah, they could have they could have started at seven hundred and fifty billion because they might want to end at five hundred billion. So if they came in with five hundred billion, the frugal states might want it to to decrease that to three hundred billion. So the fact that they came in at seven fifty, they might just have added themselves a little bit of wiggle room to end at the five hundred billion uh, eventually. So so always think about it in terms of of a, of a discussion, so a little bit of give and take. Um, I hope they agree to it, but I don't know. For me, it's it, it's looking slim based on what the the uh, the the frugal states have said before. But they might they might they might get it through. the The, the thing that we need to focus on is the nuances. If they, I, th I think they will they will eventually agree to something. Um, but the actual agreement might not be as positive as the markets are currently pricing in. So uh, if, if somebody, you know, placed the, a gun against my head and said, you had to trade, you had to decide now and so what's going to happen, I'll, I'll put my money on no agreement with further discussions. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm not just going to trade it on the back of that. We, we do need to wait for the, for the agreement. But right now, I think the market is... is um, from from my experience of how these negotiations usually go, I think the market is getting a little bit ahead of themselves right now. But I have been wrong before, so uh, we might get a, a, a across the table agreement from all 27. Um, okay. See, we have a couple of. Um, I mean, this this isn't really something that uh, this isn't really something that I I'll, I normally discuss in in webinars. But um, I think there's a couple of guys complaining about the the price for the terminal now. Obviously, sometimes we do run um, promotional prices on it. Um, at the moment, I think the, the there's a really good price for it. Um, if you compare that price to to any normal news news squawk or, or news feed out there. Um, sometimes the promo prices that we hold is, is cheaper than the normal news feeds. And that is without any of the added analysis, uh, the video commentary, the Q&A sections, the daily reports, the dominant sentiment theme, the currency drivers. Um, I think that the value in this for, for that price range is, is you're not going to get that anyway. Um, 
but sorry about that. It's just a quick, a quick rant from, uh, from my side there. Um, Okay, a quick question here on gold. What's my opinion on gold? You've just joined, so I uh, don't know if it's been discussed. So we haven't discussed gold yet. Um, I mean, from a from a from a purely fundamental point of view, I am still definitely a a a um, a bull on gold. Um, I think there's lots of factors currently supporting gold from a fundamental point of view. Uh, the biggest one from 2018 has obviously been interest rates. So. Um, gold's biggest driver is real interest rates. So whenever expectations for interest rates um, start to drop, especially U.S. interest rates specifically, uh, when U.S. interest rate expectations starts to drop, you normally see upside in uh, treasury bonds and then you normally see upside in gold as well. Now, we've seen that uptrend. When the, the moment when the U.S. economy started to basically go down in their cycle, when the economy peaked in the end of 2018, that is exactly the same time when we saw the um, the uptrend start for gold, which is November 2018. Now, that upside momentum, um, as long as interest rates is expected to go lower, obviously should see upside, and that is what we saw. Now, we had that big, big drop to the downside. Uh, now, that wasn't due to a fundamental change. That was just due to the massive spike in volatility across the board. So, asset cross-asset volatility spiked to levels never seen before, and that saw lots of out, um, a downside as lots of traders tried to um, use the um, the gold profits to pay for the losses they had in equities. And that was that big move to the downside, a great, great, great buying opportunity. Um, I actually I was in this trade from, from uh, very close to the low and um, unfortunately closed it out somewhere close to that level. So in hindsight, a stupid move, especially with the expectation of further upside. So from a, mental, from, from a fundamental point of view with interest rates being low, Obviously, that's a positive input for gold. Apart from that, you also have massive, massive financial um, repression going on right now. So think of, um, obviously, gold, it's a commodity, but it, it trades like a currency, right? So um, whenever you have massive financial repression going on uh, in the form of QE, everybody is trying to devalue their fiat currencies. So the, the, the financial repression with all of the Kiwi going on is also a great factor to the upside for something like gold. And um, that is one of the main reasons why we saw that big gold run um, just after the global financial crisis. Uh, it didn't go up until the um, Fed actually announced Kiwi. So uh, always keep that in mind. Kiwi is a very positive factor for something like gold. So from a, from a fundamental point of view, I definitely see more upside for it. Um, but I am a a value trader, so to speak. So I'm always looking for value. So I'm not going to be buying this right at the highs. Um, I do think we are getting offered a, a, a slightly better price right now um, from a technical point of view. Um, it, 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 it might be something I'm, uh, I'll be taking a stab at um, today to the upside, even if it's just a, a very, very, very small risk position. Um, but yeah, definitely still, definitely still a bull. Um, on uh, on gold right now. Um, okay, we have a question here from Werner. Uh, you don't always know what central banks are looking at on the calendar. They uh, look at inflation, sometimes GDP, and more important, sometimes GDP is more important. How do I know what they are looking at? So. The, we actually did a video on this, uh, I think just yesterday, actually, um, Werner. So just watch out for, for um, that video. I'm not sure when the, um, when the guys will be loading it on the, um, on the channels, if they are even going to load it on. But uh, I mean, the short answer, if you want that, we, we, we offer that information on a daily basis. So we have uh, current sentiment drivers reports for each of the major currencies. Uh, released on a daily basis so you know exactly what is the latest developments what's the future possible sentiment shifts what's the primary drivers uh, we also have on a weekly basis what we call the uh, fundamental drivers report so that'll basically give you our um, let's say quarterly view in terms of the fundamental bias for each of the major currencies and why we say that now we've done most of the heavy lifting for you um, if you don't have access to the terminal obviously what where you need to start is you need to start with what the central bank has said. So uh, go back to the previous um, 
go back to the previous uh, 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 statements that they've made and always try and focus on what the central bank is focusing on. So um, uh, is the central bank currently, currently focused on inflation? Have they given a specific target for that inflation uh, in terms of will they hike when it gets us to a certain level? Will, will they cut when it gets to a certain level? Uh, what are the um, expectations for growth? Obviously, when you have expectations for growth and inflation and, and employment to go down, there's obviously going to be expectations for softer monetary policy and then vice versa is also true. So always start with the economic outlook. Where is the economy going? And um, based on that rough data, so go through your, uh, employment, your employment data, inflation data, growth data, um, forward-looking indicator data, and when, you, when you're running into a, the next meeting, go and see what that data was before the prior meeting or before, uh, um, uh, with, with the prior meeting and see how that data has changed. So has the data improved or has it uh, gone down from the prior meeting? Did they expect it to go down or didn't they? That's obviously also going to be important. If everybody expects data to be bad like now and we get bad data, it's just not going to be a market mover right now. Apart from that, also the expectations on possible changes, like we said, inflation, if we're currently in a hiking cycle, right, and the central bank has already hiked five or six times, um, then one more inflation print or one more growth print or one more employment report just isn't going to be enough to move the needle because we already know where the central bank is going. Uh, where, where those data points usually comes in becomes very important is when we get to certain um, inflection points in possible changes of direction for the for the monetary policy so is this you know have they been on hold for 12 months and the markets are starting to anticipate a possible change whether up or down those are the type of things that'll that'll put you in the right direction for for knowing when to focus on what Um, uh, Rodaslav is asking, was it possible to foresee the EU recovery fund announcement to anticipate and make a use of the move? I mean, personally, for me in today's session, I saw the announcement, I saw the move, but I didn't get into this um, just because I, I, th I thought it was, there's still a lot that can go wrong about it, uh, wrong with it. Um, but the, the, the previous announcement you know, uh, from where, where Germany, Germany and, and France came out and actually introduced their, their recovery proposal, that was a very tradable event. Um, in terms of today's one, in my honest opinion, I didn't want to risk, risk this move to the upside. Uh, I just didn't think there was, there's too, there's too many moving parts right now, too many things that can go wrong. So I didn't really want to jump in specifically on something like this, but there was a lot of our traders that did. Uh, and a lot of them obviously sitting well in the money right now um, on the analyst side. So uh, th they, they traded the hopes of the recovery of, of, of an approval and not the, the actual approval itself. So there, there was a way to make money from it. Personally, for me, I didn't um, did make money on the previous announcement from, from France and Germany um, and uh, the, the previous uh, uh, announcement yesterday with the, with the ECB planning to continue buying um, Bunds, even if the Bundesbank isn't allowed to do so after the um, the the lawsuit. So for me personally, not um, Radislav, but I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of um, uh, of of the traders that uh, that capitalize on it. Uh, JCS, the calendar that I'm using is one from Zenith. Um, it's called uh, MetaStock. Zenith is the the platform. Uh, and it's basically what I use for the for the calendar as well as the central bank and political uh, monitor as well. Uh, let me just quickly move back to the uh, the, the Q and A box. I see we have a question here from Joseph. Um, you saw a spike in gold at 600 Eastern. It spiked almost $30 um, as the Aussie and Asian sessions opened. Uh, the spike disappeared about six hours later. A hand and forex.com both had it and now it's nowhere to be seen. It's off the topic. Um, by the way, I think it's great value. Um, don't think the people questioning the price are aware of 
how rare uh, you guys are on what you offer. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, I mean, to be honest, in terms of the, the, uh, the gold one, um, I didn't even see a spike like that. So and I think this is, this is Ohanda's chart. So, um, and you're saying that they, the, the spike has now gone away. I'm actually not sure. Um, I haven't heard anything on the, on the news wires as well coming through. So I'm, I'm not sure about that, mate. Um, I'm not sure whether maybe anybody in the chat has also saw the same thing or maybe has any insights, insights on that. Uh, Mark is asking, why are we seeing uh, upside on gold when sentiment is generally positive? Uh, you would have thought flows uh, would go out of gold and into currencies. Yeah, so I mean, like we said, from a, from a, from a risk point of view, you would expect gold to, to go up in, in risk on. But the, the fundamental drivers right now for gold is, is so strong. Um, you, you, you're not really seeing massive, massive outflows uh, in gold with risk on. Uh, we did see a bigger one. When was it last week when we had that big move? Um, yeah, on Monday, we had that big move to the downside. I think that was on the Moderna news. So you do still get moves uh, with risk flows, but it is going to be more muted um, with the, the strong fundamentals currently supporting, supporting the gold price. Okay, um, let me just quickly go back to the, um, to the YouTube questions. I think we've gone through most of them. Um, I think we have a question here. Uh, could you share more insight into the COT report? You've been at it for two years and still haven't figured out how it works in harmony with what we see on the chart. So um, yeah, sure, let's, let's just quickly open it up. Um, the thing about the COT is um, it's, it's good to know where positioning is. Positioning is very, it's very useful, um, but it, it, sh it shouldn't be, this is really like the last thing that I look at, to be honest. It's, you know, always, always start with your, with your, with your top down analysis, so to speak. So always start from the macro front, always start with the, you know, with, with, with what's driving currencies is always start from your, uh, from your monetary policy, that's your just that's your first outlook, and everything that happens, whether that's intermarket related or whether it's economic performance or whether it's fiscal or or whether it's geopolitics, how does that affect your central bank and your monetary policy? That's always going to be your main focus points. Um, obviously, in the short term, things like positioning is is it's interesting to look at. We we do this on a weekly basis, so we basically go through the majors, showing the net short and the net long positioning. Um, showing the weekly change. And then we have just a very quick, you know, analysis of, of, of what the recent data showed us. Now, the one thing that's super, super critical for, for COT, um, for traders to understand about the COT data is that it's always going to be, it's always going to be very lagging, right? So the data we had on Friday, um, we got on, so the data for Friday was the, the data on Friday was the 22nd, but the data we got on Friday was only up until the 19th of May. So the, your info, think about it this way, the moment when you get the CFTC data, you're, always, you're already two weeks behind what the market has already done. So it's, it's good to have it as an analysis to see how the market is positioned. Obviously, it can give you um, value opportunity. So for example, for me, the Euro, it's the biggest net long position it's been for, for a couple of weeks now. And we have seen some uh, trimming of the, of the long positioning, but it's still very much a, a net long position. And based on the current fundamentals, obviously that can change with the recovery fund to some extent in the medium term. But for me, the market is, is priced, uh, the, the euro is way too um, uh, positively priced right now in terms of the fundamentals. So for me, I'm going to look for value buys. When we see strong rallies for no reason, I'm going to look for selling opportunities in the euro. That's something that you can use it for. Um, but it, it's it's really a, a very a very lagging indicator. So it, it's it, it's good to see where the market is positioned and, and how that might help you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's something big happening now. Let's quickly have a look. Um, Brexit negotiator Frost says, we do not yet have a date for the high-level review. 
but the PM is expected to be there, says the mandate in key areas is not likely to reach an agreement and EU needs to evolve its position. Very, very negative news. Um, unfortunately, we missed that one. Um, damn it. Okay, so obviously one of the challenges when we have, when we have a webinar is we're not uh, look, uh, listening to the news. That would have been a great opportunity um, to sell the pound um, against the dollar. Uh, a little bit... A little bit late right now, um, but this is very negative. So coming coming back to coming back to what we said from um, uh, from our, our videos this morning for the pound, right? So what we're looking for uh, and the webinar is, in terms of the positive news we had yesterday, we were waiting for possible positive follow through from the UK side with regards to the 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 softening of the. Um, uh, uh, the EU stance on fisheries, but we didn't see that. We actually came back saying that, you know, not likely to see an agreement. That's a very, very negative comment. So basically the positivity that we had from yesterday on that Brexit news is basically now being priced out of the market. So that was a, a great opportunity to jump in at. Um, obviously, when it comes to the, to the dollar, something we always need to keep in mind is that it's going to be largely affected by moves in the euro. So if you're looking to capitalize on downside right now for the pound, just keep in mind, if we get positive news for the euro coming out, that is going to be negative for the dollar. And that can actually see more of a sideways movement on something like the pound versus the US dollar. So always pay strength with weakness. So if you want to capitalize on the weakness in the pound, obviously this news should be seeing downside in the equity markets as well. Let's just quickly have a look. Uh, not really seeing any big moves. Um, at this stage, some downside in the NASDAQ, nothing really major. So what we can look at is if we do see a breakdown of equities on the back of that, look to rather trade your pound against something like the, um, like the yen. Uh, and if you don't see any major moves in the equities, if, risk, if the overall risk tone stays positive, despite the fact that we had negative Brexit news, then you can always look to pair the pound against something like the Aussie which should be well supported if we see risk tones being supported as well. So very important announcement, that one. Now, obviously, if I was trading this live, um, I would have had my audio squawk um, on. So apart from waiting for it to be typed out, which is a quite, quite a big announcement, we would have had this squawk coming in live. Um, and that would have been an announcement that you can just literally open your chart and just sell from. Um, so great example of why an audio squawk is is so useful in trading. Yeah, yeah, see a lot of, a lot of uh, comments coming in now from that news. Sorry guys, I, com I completely, completely missed it with the squawk being off. Um, Great stuff, Sergey. Awesome. Sergey's saying that he caught the move um, on the pound Aussie and the pound Kiwi, a quick 70 pips banked. That is awesome, mate. That is exactly how you do it. That is exactly how you do it. You don't want to be holding those things for too long. Jump in, write it out, take profit, wait for a pullback, and you can always re-engage um, later on. That's, that's excellent, mate. Well done. Okay, um, guys, I think that is everything from everything on the Q and A side. Um, I'm not seeing anything else in the Q and A box. Not seeing anything else in the chat. Um, I obviously want to get to my own charts as well after this announcement. So um, I'm gonna let you guys go for today. Thank you very much for everybody that's, um, that's been with us for the session. Thanks as well to everybody watching on, on the YouTube side. Um, very, very nice to have you guys in the room. Thanks for all the, the questions as well. Um, always, we are, we are available on, on YouTube. If there's any questions that you guys have on any of the videos, as always, just, just ask away. Um, but from my side, uh, today is Wednesday. So for the Forex Source guys, I'm not going to catch you guys uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I think it's going to be Giles. On Friday, it's going to be Dan. So I'll only catch you guys again on, on Monday for, for my webinar. Um, but I will, of course, be with you with the uh, video commentary throughout the day. Um, so I'll just quickly do a couple of uh, updates on the pound pairs um, with, that, with that recent news.
okay, I see Dan is, is, is on the wires there as well. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining, guys. I'll catch you in the video commentary. Hope you guys have a great, great trading session. Uh, obviously, watch out for, for the EU commission. Uh, we can see some great volatility, great trading opportunities coming out for today's session. Hope you guys have a great session, great week, and I'll catch you everybody again next week. Thanks, guys. Take care.